Welcome, everyone. I'm James Brooks, uh, president of SAR, and really delighted to welcome you all here for a new year of public lectures in uh, the anthropology of food. Now, to introduce Patrick McGovern. Uh, he's a senior research scientist at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology and adjunct professor of anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania as well. Over the past two decades, he has pioneered the emerging field of molecular archaeology. Now, that's something new. In addition to being engaged in a wide range of archaeological chemical studies that include radiocarbon dating and the colorant analysis of ancient glasses and pottery technology, his most recent work has been focused on the organic analysis of vessel contents, things like dyes, like royal purple, and most significantly for us tonight, wine and beer. In addition to five earlier books, he is the author of the prize-winning Ancient Wine, The Search for the Origins of Viniculture, which we have copies, signed copies, out in the lobby if you want to pick one of those up. And next year, the University of California Press will publish his Uncorking the Past, The Human Quest for Alcoholic Beverages which is what you will be getting a preview of tonight. So let's welcome Dr. Patrick McGovern. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be here as the, uh, the sort of kickoff of uh, this uh, series on the anthropology of food. Uh, I think it's been about 35 years since I've actually been in Santa Fe, and it's a, it's a wonderful town. I had some great experiences just today uh, that I'll touch on uh, in this lecture, and I'm also delighted that my cousins from Albuquerque are here uh, this evening. Uh, I haven't seen them for quite some time as well. The, um, the topic uh, that I'm going to talk about, fermented beverages, is very dear to my heart, research, and palate. <laughs> I mean, in order to really understand ancient fermented beverages, I mean, you have to do some tastings of modern beverages from time to time. So that makes this a very interesting field. Uh, also, uh, you can't have food without drink. And uh, beverages uh, can be just as nutritious as any uh, other natural product, in fact, more so, because the fermentation process will actually uh, increase the amount of vitamins and protein from the yeast primarily and also accentuate different aromas and tastes and they will detoxify the food and will cause it to be better preserved and the alcohol uh, that you get in a fermented beverage is, uh, actually kills uh, harmful microbes so if you're in a if, if you're in a time you know thousands you know millions of years ago even uh, in which you're going to be exposed to lots of microbes, if you're drinking a fermented beverage, you actually have a better chance of surviving and living longer and reproducing more. So, uh, you know, there, you just keep that in mind as we talk about uh, the importance of uh, uh, fermented beverages in human history. Um, now, I'll start out with this book that I wrote on ancient wine. Uh, it's, it's probably uh, as good a place as any for me, at least, to start. Uh, and I'll try to, you know, give you a glimpse at, uh, you know, how important uh, fermented beverages really have been in human history. And we'll, we'll travel back in time, uh, not just to the origins of human culture, but the prehistory, uh, you know, millions of years ago. And uh, in the book, I mean, I actually lay out sort of a new framework of how to understand uh, fermented beverages based on recent discoveries. Uh, I'm also an archaeologist, so there's a good deal of archaeology there for everybody to try to digest. Um, and I'm also a chemist, so we do a, a lot of analyses, uh, as James mentioned, of the contents of the vessels, trying to uh, figure out what ancient compounds are, are there that will help us to understand what the original contents of the vessel uh, were. And, of course, you can't ignore the textual evidence that you get during historical periods and also the artwork. And particularly in the case of wine, uh, we have ma magnificent depictions of winemaking, uh, especially from Egypt, but, you know, other places as well. 
Uh, and then you try to you know, look at the modern uh, ethnographic uh, picture that may reflect uh, what the ancient uh, situation would have been. So you have to you know, play with the variables there. And then finally, this is probably the, the sort of the most uh, interesting, exciting part from my point of view, is to try to recreate some of these ancient beverages that we have chemical evidence for. And we try to really bring them back to life, as it were. And you'll see that some of these beverages are very strange. I mean, we're not just talking about your typical uh, grape wine or barley beer, but what we call extreme beverages. Ones that have you know, components and ingredients that sort of boggle uh, the imagination, but which, as we've discovered, uh, you really can get uh, you know, fantastic tastes and aromas that you never could have uh, gotten other otherwise. And uh, we're sort of like pioneering a, a whole new field here. Uh, the uh, study, the scientific study of ancient organic remains is what I've been involved with, which I've really pioneered uh, as one of the people in this field uh, over the past 20 years. And what this entails, and I'm not going to get into all the nitty gritty of uh, the chemical instrumentation, but you know, in the past uh, 20, 30, 40 years, there has really been a revolution in being able to uh, use different chemical methods to figure out uh, what an ancient organic uh, material is comprised of. And then working from that back to what the original natural products would be. And I mean, we're really just at the beginning of a process, I think, that's going to revolutionize, in a way, uh, archaeology, because most of what we are as humans is organic. And uh, you know, by using these techniques, we can really figure out a great deal, not just about fermented beverages, but about the houses we lived in, the clothes, uh, medicines, and so forth. Um, now, uh, this uh, sort of blending together of the modern technology with the ancient is something that was really driven home to me uh, when I got into the uh, wine vat here in Portugal and stomped out the grapes. I mean, all you know, uh, beverage drinkers, uh, wine drinkers especially, can appreciate uh, you know, how uh, there's, a, there's an ancient or a time dimension to, uh, to these beverages. Uh, for instance, you age the wine in oak barrels, you know, and you're going to sort of mellow out that wine by doing that aging process. So here we've got a very traditional method, which actually is very practical, because it turns out that the human foot is ideally contoured uh, with the arch so that it will press down on the grapes but it won't break the seeds and the seeds have lots of tannic uh, materials in them that give a bitter flavor and they will float up to the surface and that can then be just skimmed off and then you have you know much better wine as a result um, so that was a very good vintage by the way 2003 for the port uh, vintage on the Duero River of Portugal. Now my studies of uh, grape wine really got going uh, back in 1991 when uh, I organized a conference at the Robert Mondavi uh, Winery on the origins and ancient history of wine. Now this is a week-long conference and if you ever wondered what a Greek symposium was like you should have been at this conference because we would have for lunch maybe two wines, but then at dinner we would have four or five wines with you know, really excellent cuisine. And we, all we did was talk about ancient wine. And we brought together specialists from all different disciplines, uh, botany, genetics, uh, archaeology, history, and so forth, many of whom had never actually been in the same room together. But you get them uh, drinking wine and talking about their <laughs> their expertise and it really did uh, nourish a lot of ideas that then you know individual scholars have said they went back and you know their research was sort of set for the next 10 or 20 years as a result and in a way that's what happened to me too uh, because now the uh, the vessel that you see here was the first one that we uh, we analyzed uh, that contained wine it, you know it looks very nondescript it's from a site of, in Iran, up in the Zagros Mountains, dated about 3500 BC. And you might think, Iran? Uh, 
You know, what, what are they doing with wine? Because if you go there today, of course, it's forbidden. Although I'm, I'm told there are, you know, little areas where the people are still producing it, of course. Uh, but this uh, woman, Virginia Badler, she came to me uh, with this uh, jar and uh, had noted a red residue on the bottom of it. And uh, she thought it might be wine. We were very skeptical at the time. Uh, but since we had had success with identifying royal purple, the dye, uh, we thought we would give it a, a go. And it did turn out to be a wine based on the finding of tartaric acid, which is the principal acid in grapes. And it's very specific uh, for grapes in the Middle East because there's no other plant in the Middle East that has uh, tartaric acid in large amounts. And it also had a tree resin uh, added to it, uh, terebinth tree resin. So what we had was a resonated wine. And I don't know if uh, any of you have been to Greece, but there's something produced in Greece called retsina. Uh, it's kind of an acquired taste, having a tree resin. <laughs> but, it, uh, but if you're in Greece, it really seems like the best thing to be drinking with your moussaka and, you know, looking out over the Aegean and so on. And uh, so that was our, uh, at the time, our earliest evidence uh, for grape wine. In fact, it extended it back like 2,000 years. And um, uh, this was sort of the star of the show and, and led to organizing this conference. But if you think about it, uh, you know, 3500 BC may seem like a long time uh, to some of us. Uh, but, you know, the human species has been around for, um, you know, millions of years. So uh, even, if, even if we don't have the chemical evidence, we can make certain suppositions about what might have happened in the preceding hundreds and uh, thousands of years before 3500 uh, BC because um, if, if you... Uh, you could imagine that humans would have been interested in any sort of brightly colored fruit, uh, and one that had a high sugar content, especially. So if they saw grapes, say, hanging, or some other fruit hanging from a tree, uh, they would be attracted to that, and they'd also be interested, you know, once they had a taste of it. So here we have some of our ancestors sort of foraging around uh, in a river bottom looking for some of these fruits. Now, we know that all animals going from the fruit fly all the way up to the elephant are very attracted to sugar and alcohol. Alcohol plumes, you know, they, they smell it and they're actually attracted by it. And if you look at primates in general, most of them have a diet comprised of about 75% fruit. And if you put them, uh, if you give them the, the opportunity, they will gorge themselves on fermented fruit. You, know, you could get natural fermentation of the fruit, or they, uh, if they had some sort of a uh, drink you know, offered, if they could get a drink somehow, they will just keep drinking. And uh, it's not then difficult to imagine that our uh, ancestors probably uh, would have been drawn you know, to the same sorts of fermented fruit and beverages. The only problem is we don't have the actual archeological or chemical evidence for this as yet. Now this theory, uh, is sometimes called the Paleolithic or the drunken monkey hypothesis. And uh, what we can imagine is uh, they espy this, uh, this, this, this brightly colored fruit, they, they take a whole bunch of it, they put it into whatever container they have. It could just be a leather bag or a wooden container of some sort. And if you get enough grapes or other fruit or even honey, honey is a very high sugar uh, natural product into the container, um, eventually uh, you get juices uh, forming at the bottom. Now for honey, you actually have to dilute the honey with water uh, to get the yeast to start to act, uh, act on it. But uh, you will have a situation in which, you know, if they have enough grapes, you know, sort of pressing down, you'll get grapes oozing out of the skins and accumulating on the bottom. And that, uh, that juice, with its high sugar is a, like a perfect nutrient uh, mix for the yeast that is living on the, the surface of high sugar fruits. And actually yeasts are in honey as well. So you can then imagine over a day or two as they're eating their fruit or they're 
uh, gobbling up their diluted honey, eventually uh, this will have fermented, you know, especially in a warm climate. As you reach the bottom and you will put your fingers into this, uh, this liquid and you will get you know, the aromatic qualities of that fermented beverage and then you also get some mind-altering effects. So it, uh, it does, it's not hard to imagine that they might you know, try to come back over and over again to try to uh, see you know, how much more of this they, they could consume. Uh, one of the problems uh, with this uh, Beaujolais Nouveau, we could call it, this is a Stone Age Beaujolais Nouveau, is you had to drink it very fast because they had no way of preserving it. Now in the case, if, they had, if they'd added tree resin, tree resin actually has preservative properties, uh, that would have helped, but they had no container that they could stop her, you know, like our glass bottles with a cork, uh, you know, this didn't exist. So they, they really had to drink this in season as quickly as possible. Um, so uh, if we want to really get some early evidence, and uh, the best period to look for is uh, this early uh, fermented beverage would be the Neolithic uh, period, which goes from about 8,500 down to 4,000, BC, uh, and uh, this is the time when you get uh, year-round villages being built. And uh, here we have the site, another site in Iran, uh, that has actually yielded our earliest published evidence for wine. It's called Haji Firuz Tepe, uh, 5400 BC. And this is an example of one of the villages that were being built all across the Middle East in this sort of revolutionary period in which uh, various plants and animals, uh, uh, sheep, sheep, goat, um, uh, cow, and so forth were being domesticated, and also many plants, including, we think, uh, the grape, because if you can domesticate the grape, you can actually make more fruit and you can make more wine. And this becomes sort of a, uh, a light motif of, of why people domesticate many plants all around the world. Uh, say corn, uh, millet, uh, rice, and so forth. Uh, if you can domesticate it, usually you get more of that particular product, and then you're able to make more of the fermented beverage. It uh, is also a time when we get the first pottery invented. And this is gonna be very important for our analyses because once you have pottery, uh, you have special vessels that you can make whatever fermented beverage it is in, you can keep it by putting usually a clay stopper on a narrow mouth. And then also, if it's a liquid, it gets absorbed into the pottery. And it gets held by the ionic forces of the pottery uh, for thousands of years. So that when we come along and extract it out with different organic solvents, we can actually uh, get these ancient uh, organic compounds and identify them. Uh, finally. Uh, it's a time when really the, the first cuisine, uh, you could say, is emerging. Because you have all these domesticated plants and animals, you're now able to make you know, the first bread, the first barley beer, uh, all different kinds of stews you know, with these domesticated animals that you have available to you. And in many ways, a lot of the foods that we enjoy today, they go back thousands of years, back even to the Neolithic uh, period. So this is the, what we thought would be the uh, period to look for, for the earliest evidence of grape wine. And since I come from the University of Pennsylvania Museum, uh, I have a sort of an easy task. All I have to do is uh, go back to my museum and find uh, the resident uh, Neolithic uh, archaeologist and start asking them if, if they found any interesting uh, vessels that might have a residue on the inside that might possibly point to a, a fermented beverage. So in this case, um, uh, I had, um, I don't know if this is working now, oh, here it is. Uh, Mary Voigt, who had excavated the site of Haji Firuz uh, back in 1968, and uh, she's actually sitting in the room where the jar, one of the jars uh, that we analyzed uh, was located. It's, it's a kitchen. And uh, I just asked her, um, you know, had she uh, seen any interesting residues? And on the inside of this jar, on the bottom, had been a yellowish residue. And at the time, she thought that might be a milk product. 
Uh, but back in 1968, they really didn't have the techniques to uh, determine if that were true or not. So she dug the sherds out of storage. Uh, we had two of the vessels in Philadelphia, four were in Iran still. And uh, it turned out that we again had a resonated wine. And this is just an ordinary house at the site of Haji Farouz, but it had six of these vessels embedded in the clay floor. And altogether, uh, it had, uh, well, each of these is about uh, two and a half gallons. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, 15 liters or so. So uh, 12, 12 liters, I guess. Uh, so it's about 60 liters just in one ordinary house. And there were many of these houses, you know, extended out over the whole site. So we're really talking about, you know, a fairly large production of grape wine already at quite an early period. Now, uh, you might think, well, the Near East is the cradle of civilization. You know, we, we should expect to find, you know, very early wine, very early beer uh, there. Uh, but then I got involved uh, on the other side of Asia in China. And uh, to my amazement, uh, we have something even earlier that comes from there. And this is from the Yellow River Valley, uh, which, um, it, it runs right along here. And at the site of Jiahu, uh, there was quite an extensive settlement of uh, the settlement itself, again, from the Neolithic period, uh, and then burials. And this dates back to the Neolithic period, but uh, 7,000 BC. So it's another 2,000 years uh, before Haji Firuz. And, uh, what we found out is that they had been making and using a, a, a beverage, an extreme beverage. Uh, it had many different components, and it uh, uh, really opened up a whole new area for me and, and showed that other parts of the world uh, could have you know, just as interesting uh, fermented beverages as the Middle East. Now, some of you may have seen uh, mention of uh, this, it, it did make uh, the front, uh, front page of the San Francisco Chronicle, it was in the New York Times, it went all around the world. Uh, but my, one of my colleagues in China, uh, who's a, uh, a microbiologist, uh, Guan Sheng, he said that it had gotten into the official Chinese newspaper, uh, Xinhua. And as a result, I had become a star of the CCP, that's the Chinese Communist Party. And it actually became kind of a, uh, a problem for us because once we started to try to recreate this beverage, uh, the Chinese felt as if we were stealing their heritage. And uh, you know, I encouraged uh, the microbrewer who had done the recreation to, uh, to work together with the Chinese, uh, or they could do their own version. Uh, but there was like a whole controversy that went on in China about uh, you know, what the, the legal ramifications of, of using our ancient recipe were. Now, what was the ancient recipe and uh, what was this all about? Well, um, these are the, the, uh, the vessels that we analyzed. And uh, this is some of the earliest pottery ever produced anywhere in the world. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, pottery begins around 6,000 BC. In East Asia, it goes back to 10,000 BC. And this is 7,000 BC. And you can notice how beautifully contoured these vessels are. They have very high necks that uh, splay outward. You know, they would be ideal for serving a liquid, a beverage. And uh, so these are the, the vessels that uh, we analyzed that did have also residues uh, that we could collect. And, um, and then we went through a process of, of uh, doing analyses. Now, for the chemically challenged among you, I'm not going to get into all the uh, detailed chemical uh, analysis that we did, but we used techniques like infrared spectrometry, liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, and together we can build up a picture of what these ancient uh, compounds were. And we're particularly looking for fingerprint compounds. These are biomarkers or fingerprint compounds that uh, will be very specific to one natural product, like tartaric acid is to grapes in the Middle East. 
And uh, in China, though, it's a little more complicated. Uh, there are other sources of tartaric acid, which we did identify in these jars, and that is hawthorn fruit. Uh, hawthorn fruit actually has four times the amount of tartaric acid that grapes uh, do. And so that's why I have an and or. According to the chemical evidence, it could be either grape or hawthorn fruit or both. And you know, just from the chemical evidence, we couldn't really say for sure. Uh, and then we identified beeswax, and uh, this is a very good marker for honey, because you can never totally filter out all the beeswax. And the beeswax have very specific compounds uh, that you can identify. And so presumably, you know, that beeswax would have come from honey. Um, unless you saw some sort of a layer on the inside of the vessel that might indicate a sealant, but there was nothing like that. And then finally, there were other compounds that pointed to rice. So we've got a, a what is an, called an extreme beverage. Uh, you might call it a Neolithic grog. Uh, it is something that's got a whole bunch of components uh, put into it. Um, uh, grape and or hawthorn fruit, uh, rice. Now, you know, we can debate about whether that rice should be called wine or beer. Uh, the usual definition for beer is it comes from a grain, and rice is a grain. But uh, uh, the way uh, a lot of times rice uh, is processed, you know, they make sake and other uh, uh, rice beverages in China, is it does have a fairly high alcoholic content, up to, say, 10%. And it's also very aromatic. So I tend to uh, look upon that as being like a rice wine in quotation marks. And it also had honey, uh, so that would be a mead. And uh, you know, you mix all these together and, and this is what happens to you. <laughs> and when we first started you know, coming up with these extreme beverages, we just couldn't understand. I mean, how can you mix a wine, a beer, and mead together? You know, but as we've done more and more research, especially back into the Neolithic period, we see that these people were very experimental. I mean, they're not just domesticating plants and animals. They are playing around with different kinds of cuisines, different kinds of beverages. And in a way, we are the ones that have become restricted in our thinking. Because you know, we become specialists in wine making, or beer making, or meat making. And you know, for the experimental beverage maker or the Neolithic, you know, let's just toss everything into the pot and see what happens. And then, of course, you can serve it probably to all the people of the village. And if anybody keels over, you know, you know you probably shouldn't head in that direction any further, but if, if they start saying, well, this is pretty good, you know, you know you're on the right track. Uh, anyway, that's my sort of imaginative recreation of, of how these people might have thought about it. Um, now, the hawthorn fruit, this is some hawthorn fruit on the left, uh, is interesting, but, but more interesting is the grape, because this is the earliest uh, instance that we have chemically of grape being used in any fermented beverage. And as far as we know, the Chinese never domesticated the grape. They have more species of grape than anywhere else in the world. They have some 40 different species. And of course, this could change with further investigation. But as far as we know, they never uh, domesticated any of those. The only grape that was ever domesticated was the Eurasian uh, Vetus vinifera. And that accounts for 99% of all the different wines that we have, uh, all the different varietals, you know, like 10,000 varietals. But they're all coming from that one species. Now, in China, we do know that they have some very high sugar uh, grape species, like Vetus amarensis. It has about 20% sugar. So you know, presumably, they could have been picking wild grapes and putting it into this beverage. Um, and you know, it's just a, a question you know, we still you know, have to leave for the future, maybe, to resolve the domestication issue. Uh, the importance of the fruit is that it has the yeast. Also, the honey has yeast, too. Uh, but uh, if you're going to get fermentation occurring, you've got to have yeast. And that's where the fruit is really the crucial uh, part of it. This is a, a yeast uh, budding. And of course, they could not see the yeast, I and mean, that's only since Pasteur that people have microscopically been able to observe a, a yeast organism. But it is what 
is changing that sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide. And it would, it would have been really a fantastic, almost miraculous process to see the bubbling of the carbon dioxide and you know, just uh, you know, drinking it and getting the mind-altering experience. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, these fermented beverages get incorporated into religions uh, very strongly. And uh, we just have to look around at our own religions to see you know, how wine is right at the center. But any fermented beverage uh, can, has this potential. Uh, now the rice uh, is, uh, is probably, uh, we don't know if it's a wild or domesticated rice at Jiahu. It's some of the earliest rice found in China. Uh, and uh, the real issue with rice is it, it doesn't have sugar, it has starch. And so how did they break the starch down into sugar? Now one way to do it is to chew it. And this is a method that's still used uh, today to make uh, corn beer, chicha. Uh, also in, the, in East Asia, in Japan and Taiwan, uh, at marriage ceremonies, the women will sit around a big pot and they will chew rice and then spit the rice uh, out into the large pot. We have enzymes in our uh, saliva that will break starch down into sugar. And then the fermentation, you know, once you spit it into your, your large uh, bowl or vat, you know, then the fermentation somehow starts. Uh, and eventually you got enough uh, uh, rice wine uh, to uh, celebrate your marriage. Uh, another way to do this is to sprout it and make a malt. Uh, we're not really sure you know, how they would have done this in the Neolithic period in China. And finally, there's another method only in China uh, that's much later, we think, which uh, they take different kinds of molds, uh, things like uh, rhizopus and monascus, and that those molds will attack the starch and break it down into sugar. Uh, but however it was done, um, you end up with a lot of debris coming up to the surface. And the, the best way to get past the debris, uh, past the hulls and the yeast and so forth that's floating on the surface, is to take a drinking tube or a straw. And this is, the time, this is really the time-honored way of drinking beer, especially uh, in the Middle East. And also here is a, uh, today, or, or very recently, in a village in southern China, they're drinking rice wine by all gathering around with their long straws and uh, indulging themselves. Now, Jiahu uh, really is not your run-of-the-mill uh, Neolithic site. I mean, it, it has some of the earliest pottery, it has some of the earliest rice, uh, and it also has something else that I find very fascinating. It has uh, flutes. It had three dozen flutes, uh, bone flutes, uh, that were recovered from the burials. And uh, these flutes um, have two to eight holes that are very carefully drilled into the bone. Now, the, flute, the bones, uh, these 36 uh, flutes, uh, have, uh, they were made just from one specific bone of a bird called the red-crowned crane, and it's the ulna, one of the arm bones. And this uh, red-crowned crane, it does an elaborate mating dance in which it will bow, raise its wings, uh, and then it does a very intense ringing uh, sound. Uh, and it, it could very well be that if you were uh, a human, you know, listening to this uh, bird song, that you'd get inspired enough to think, well, you know, I've got to make my musical instrument from a bone of that bird. And then the, uh, the musicians of Jiahu you know, actually had these flutes, a pair of them, uh, buried right beside them. Uh, this is the excavator of Jiahu, uh, Zhejiang Zhang, and he's uh, playing one of these. These are the earliest, earliest playable musical instruments that have ever been found. And by holding every uh, hole uh, closed except one, you, and you do that you know, with each of the holes, uh, you can uh, produce the traditional pentatonic Chinese scale, the same scale that's used today to play traditional Chinese music. I mean, this is what's so remarkable about China, is we have these long expanses of tradition 
that come right up to the present. And uh, uh, so here we've got the, the musical instrument uh, and we've got the, the fermented beverage. Um, we've also got possibly uh, writing. This is still debatable. Uh, but on, some, on many of the tortoise shells, there are actual uh, glyphs or uh, markings, this one in the form of an eye, uh, and some of these actually appear thousands of years later uh, during the Shang Dynasty, from about 1600 down to 1050 BC. And um, you don't have you know, sequences of these, so you know, there's still a question about whether they're just you know, individual symbols or whether you, do you really have true writing is still a question. But uh, in the later Shang uh, Dynasty, these uh, tortoise shells were very important uh, for the shaman priests in, in order to pr predict the future and assure the welfare of the kingdom. And so, uh, you know, possibly they're serving something, a similar function here uh, 6,000 years early, earlier at Jiahu, and it may all be sort of bound up in the musical instrument fermented beverage package. Um, because uh, in these later texts uh, that we have from the Shang Dynasty, uh, we have pretty specific information about uh, the way the ancestor worship was carried out. And this is where if the person dies, you would select a, a representative from the family who's called the Shi. And this uh, Shi would have to drink uh, nine uh, fairly large goblets of a rice or millet wine. Now, these vessels, you know, if we assume uh, the same size for the Neolithic period, this is about a liter and a half of a 10% alcoholic beverage. This would definitely get you inebriated. Uh, the, uh, you know, but this is the whole idea, because you get the mind-altering effect, and at the same time, the spirits of the other ancestors who've gone before, uh, they are said to all become drunk. And... Uh, so the, uh, you know, they're very you know, specific about the, uh, the ceremony that was carried out. And at the end of the ceremony, you'd have the beating of drums and the playing of uh, some sort of music. And it could be that the flutes you know, would have served in that sort of ancestor cult as well uh, much earlier at Jiahu. Now, uh, this is the label for our recreated beverage. Uh, it's called Chateau Jiahu. Uh, named after the site in uh, China, and it kind of pushes the envelope both on the label and <laughs> on the contents. Uh, the contents, uh, uh, we decided, uh, actually it turned out that the, uh, the Chinese have started to do botanical analyses, and the only seeds that they found of fruits at Jiahu turned out to be grape and hawthorn, which fit very nicely and you know, corroborated our... Uh, uh, chemical evidence. So we put both uh, hawthorn fruit and grape into this beverage. Now this beverage is made by a very experimental uh, microbrewer, Sam Calgione, at the Dogfish Head Brewery in Delaware. And he is like the equal of any Neolithic experimental brewer. He, uh, you just have to go to their website and you'll understand why. He just will take any ingredient and throw it in the mix. Uh, winemakers are much more conservative. You know, I've tried to work with winemakers on these sort of projects, but beer makers tend to be the ones that uh, are willing to take some chances. Uh, so we had the Hawthorne fruit, uh, we had uh, grapes. Uh, we couldn't get grapes from China, unfortunately, but we did use Muscat grapes. Uh, it's a Vitus vinifera, but has early precedence in the uh, Middle East. Uh, a wildflower honey, and then uh, rice, um, and the rice had the hulls uh, with it, and then we used a sake yeast to, uh, to ferment this. And um, you know, it, it comes out being kind of a sweet and sour profile. It goes very well with Chinese food. I can recommend it highly, of course I would. Uh, and then you may be wondering you know, about this, uh, this uh, enigmatic tattoo right here on our sort of 1920s flapper looking woman who's holding up a champagne glass. Uh, this is actually the sign for an alcoholic beverage uh, in Chinese. And it shows a jar with three drops going off the lip of the jar. This, is, this sign, still used today, goes all the way back to the Shang Dynasty. Again, an example of how strong tradition really is in China. 
Um, we also did Shang Dynasty um, beverages, analyzed those. I'll just say a couple of words about it. Um, some of these Shang Dynasty tombs, you'll have many bronze vessels, and they have very tight lids on them. And in this particular tomb, I think it was 52 out of the 90 bronze vessels still had liquid in them, if you can believe this. From 3,000 years ago, there was still liquid. And what happens is the, the mouth of the vessel, it, it oxidizes and rusts, and it seals off that uh, neck, and it sort of hermetically seals it. So you get evaporation down to about a third of the liquid, and then it's just sealed off. And so I was, when I was in China, I was actually presented with liquid samples that were 3,000 years old. And when we did the analysis, these turned out to be more specialized than the Neolithic uh, extreme beverage. Uh, they're usually either rice wine, just strictly rice wine, or strictly millet wine. And then they, but they did have some very interesting uh, herbs and uh, tree resins and flowers that were added to them. Um, this is uh, absinthe. Uh, it's in the same family, wormwood. I mean, wormwood is the general uh, name for that family of uh, herbs. Um, now, uh, you know, you might ask just a base. I'm, I'm getting close to the end here, so uh, I'm, I'm going to do the Americas in a, in a short time here. But you might ask at this point, uh, what, where, where did the earliest uh, alcoholic beverage come from? You know, was it the Middle East? Was it China? East Asia? And, um, you know, there's some interesting hints uh, that they could have been in contact with each other at a very early date. For instance, uh, here's the sign for an alcoholic beverage in China with the three drops coming off of it. This is the early Sumerian sign from 3500 BC for beer. This is from Mesopotamia. It has a pointed uh, jar, just like the Chinese jar. It doesn't have the drops going off of it. Uh, we know that they both are using uh, drinking tubes or straws to drink these beverages. Um, and, uh, you know, what we might suppose is that there's some kind of transmission of ideas about domestication and how to make a fermented beverage that goes in very short steps you know, across the whole expanse of Central Asia. Unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of uh, excavation in this area, so we don't really know how direct, uh, it wasn't a direct contact because there's no artifacts, you know, from China going back to the Middle East or vice versa, but it could be very short steps of, uh, you know, ideas between humans uh, moving across this great expanse. And, um, you know, I'll just leave that as a, a hypothesis because they do, uh, you know, really show up about the same time, and although they use different natural products, uh, rice and hawthorn fruit uh, in Asia, East Asia, and grapes in the Middle East, and barley in the Middle East, uh, still the same basic ideas seem to be at work. Uh, finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Americas. I mean, after all, I mean, we're, we're here in the Americas, and uh, uh, the uh, School of Advanced Research had a lot to do with the uh, investigation of uh, early uh, Americans. Um, and I'm going to, you know, 20, say 20,000, 15,000 years ago, the people from Asia uh, made their way down along the coast of uh, North and Central South America, uh, perhaps by boat. I mean, that seems to be uh, the current hypothesis. They seem to keep to the, uh, the coast. And I will uh, focus on some of our finds uh, relating to chocolate from a site in Honduras, uh, Puerto Escondido. Now, the last person in this series on anthropology of food, John Henderson from Cornell, he will be giving a lot more description of this, too. And so I don't want to steal all of his thunder. Uh, I'll just say, I'll say a few things about the chemical side of it, and you know, maybe this will entice you to come back and hear his lecture as well. Uh, but. Uh, you know, you can imagine that they might have carried traditions of how to make a fermented beverage with them, you know, from Asia down into the Americas. The problem is, once you get down into the Americas, you've got a whole new set of plants that you have to figure out how to ferment. I mean, you've got the cactus, uh, you know, all the cactus, cacti that you're familiar with in this area. You've got corn, and that went through, maize went through an extensive um, 
genetic development to become the corn that we know today. And uh, it does seem that, again, the domestication process is often, I can't go into this in detail, I do more in this book on uncorking the past that's going to come out next year, but many of these plants, uh, the motivation for their domestication does seem to have been a fermented beverage, uh, for instance, corn, um, because the stalk of the, uh, the corn plant is very sugary, uh, much like sugarcane, and they first started by chewing on the stalk and then eventually uh, got to develop the ear so that it, the, they could get more sugar uh, from the ear to make uh, chicha. Now, uh, I think chocolate really illustrates how they would have had to uh, improvise to come up with a, a new fermented beverage. And this is uh, the chocolate fruit that you see here. And it's called uh, Theobroma cacao. And Theobroma, this name was actually given by the famous uh, Swedish botanist Linnaeus to it. And it means uh, food broma of the gods, Theobroma. And uh, it turns out to be a very appropriate name because uh, it really was right at the center of Amer early American religion. The, uh, here you see uh, uh, the fruit, as I say, and it, it, it only grows under very specific, this tree is very, uh, uh, you know, it has to have just the right conditions. It has to have water year-round. It can't have temperatures dropping below 60 degrees Fahrenheit and so forth. So there's only very specific areas of, uh, for this species uh, in Central America where it does grow. And uh, one of those is the area where the site of Puerto Escondido is located, the one that John Henderson excavated. Uh, another area is Belize. And another area is Soconusco, which is in southwest Mexico on the Pacific side. And that was really the prize area of the Aztecs for getting chocolate. Now, the, the fruit uh, is a, this large pod. It's almost like a football-sized pod. And it grows directly out. Uh, once the flower is fertilized, it grows right out from the trunk of the tree. So you have these big pods you know, sitting on the, on the tree. And it has a very sweet fruit uh, inside a pulp uh, that's about 15% sugar. And, it, and then the beans that you can see here, there's about 30 or 40 beans that are embedded in this fruity pulp, this high sugar pulp. And what, um, what uh, happens is, uh, what, what we're hypothesizing is that uh, early humans would have been attracted especially to this sweet fruit. And that sweet fruit will, does ferment into a alcoholic beverage of about 7% alcohol. And uh, in fact, the way that you produce chocolate today is you have to go through a fermentation process and to get the beans out. Now, if you're just interested in the beans, you know, a lot of times you'll throw away that, that, uh, that alcoholic uh, product that's uh, been produced from the pulp. But, you know, at the early stages, we can imagine that they would have been pretty interested in that alcoholic beverage, uh, even if they're going after the beans. And there's uh, one recorded instance, uh, just as an example, uh, by the Spanish chroniclers uh, who observed a lot of the uh, Indian uh, behavior. Uh, on the coast of Guatemala, uh, on the Pacific side, um, they, uh, they noticed that the Indians were piling all these pods of fruit into a dugout canoes. And then they would just let the, you know, the fruit ferment right in the canoes, and then they would drink that liquid. And uh, uh, there still are places in Central and South America where you can find the fermented beverage uh, made just from the pulp. These are the kinds of ve vessels that we analyzed from Puerto Escondido. Uh, this one, again, uh, from Honduras. Uh, and working with a, a fellow scientist at uh, Hershey Chocolate, um, Jeff Hurst, uh, we were able to determine that this definitely contained the fingerprint compound for chocolate in Mesoamerica, and that's called theobromine, named after the tree itself, theobroma. 
And another interesting uh, detail, this uh, vessel, which is very early, this is uh, some of the earliest American pottery, but uh, only 1400 BC, not uh, 10,000 BC, uh, but it is pre-Omec, is that the, uh, you'll notice that there are these indentations and ridges, uh, and it's a very long-necked uh, beverage, it would, uh, vessel that would be very ideal uh, for a liquid. But if you go back and uh, take a look at the, uh, this uh, variety, the Criollo, which is a very aromatic, uh, the Mesoamerican variety is, is extremely tasty, uh, you'll see the same sort of indentations and ridges. So this is like an advertisement of what the contents were. Even if we hadn't uh, you know, found the, the chemical compound theobromine, uh, which we did in, in many of John Henderson's uh, and Rosemary Joyce's vessels, uh, you, know, you're, you're, you know, the people actually made a vessel that really imitates the cacao fruit. Now, later, as you go into Mayan and Aztec times, they seem to get away uh, to some degree, but they still use the, the, the fermented juice. But they also start using the beans. And the beans have a much higher concentration of theobromine, and, and of course, are much more bitter. Um, and uh, they also start adding lots of other ingredients, uh, honey, different kinds of flowers, uh, chilies. Now, uh, today I had the opportunity, just by chance, to go to a place here in Santa Fe called uh, Cacao, named after the cacao uh, plant, um, uh, Paseo, I forget the exact uh, street name, uh, but it's, it's right down in the center of town. And they actually are, are recreating uh, chocolate beverages with some of these uh, later ingredients, especially the chilies and different kinds of flowers and spices and so forth. And uh, it was really, for me, I'd never had an opportunity to taste uh, you know, chocolate made the Mayan or Aztec way. So this is quite an exciting day for me just to sort of happen in on this uh, shop and to get a chance to taste some of these things. The other thing that the later uh, Mayan and Aztecs do is they foam, they foam the beverage. You see that? Uh, they use a, a stick usually uh, to stir around. And um, here you also see some uh, chocolate mole covered tamales here of this uh, Mayan ruler who's eyeing this drink. And apparently the idea was to actually inhale the, the foam as, at the same time that you drank it. So you sort of got a double whammy from, from this drink. And uh, many of the most ornate and beautiful vessels that we have from the Mayan period um, are actually uh, containers for chocolate. And this is an especially unusual uh, one uh, from Belize, or I, I, yeah, Belize, I believe, uh, 500 AD, uh, that has a, a swivel on uh, top that you can lock it. So you've got this precious chocolate beverage on the inside, and uh, this was confirmed by chemical analysis that there is theobromine. And then uh, you can uh, protect it you know, by having this uh, very special cover. And if you look very carefully, you can actually see this, the sign uh, for cacao, uh, which is a, a fish's head and a fin over here on the side. And if you go to the cacao chocolate place, they use that as the logo of their, uh, of their company. Uh, and the uh, fish head and the fin are both pronounced ka, ka. So you have ka, ka, uh, cacao. And uh, the, um, the later uh, Mesoamerican people you know, were uh, obviously very taken with this because this becomes the elite beverage of the Americas. Rice wine might have been, or millet wine might have been the elite beverage in China on which the religion was focused. But, uh, uh, and in, grape, in the Middle East, it's grape wine, but when you get to the Americas, it's chocolate that's right at the center of uh, the uh, religion and, and the upper class activities. Now, we've also gone on and uh, done a recreation of uh, this beverage. Uh, we couldn't uh, bring uh, the fruit uh, from Honduras up to the States. It would, it would spoil. Uh, Dogfish had also had a part in putting this together, and this is the label. Uh, but we were able to uh, do something, you know, equally equally good. We got dark chocolate from 
of the prize area of the Aztecs is uh, Soconusco uh, in southwest Mexico. There's only one importer of that in the United States in Missouri. That's the first time it's really been imported. The dark chocolate has been imported into the U.S. And, uh, and then uh, we got ancho chili that we put in. So this has like a, it's not a real hot chili, but it's, it's something interesting. And then also achiote or anato, which gives a very dark red color, not dark, but a red color to it. And the reason we did that, it's mentioned in the ancient text too, but the main reason was because chocolate was associated with blood. Also the fruit, you know, with the ridges and the indentations, is associated with a human heart. And um, human sacrifices were fairly common among the, uh, the Aztecs. And so uh, if you were a, a young, you know, virile uh, sacrifice at the top of your pyramid and you faltered in, in going through with this, this whole sacrificial uh, activity, uh, what they would do is they'd give you a gourd of chocolate in which they had taken flint blades that had been caked with blood from a previous sacrifice that was then mixed in <laughs> with the chocolate. And uh, that was supposed to give you enough courage to go through with it. Uh, now, um, the name of this is Theobroma. And uh, you know, for some of the older members of the audience, you might kind of associate this with Broma Seltzer. But it, uh, it, it's far from that, and it really is, it's, it's, it's a food of the gods, and it's named after the tree. And uh, I think it, uh, well, it'll be coming on the market uh, this month, but unfortunately, uh, Dogfish Head does not distribute to uh, New Mexico. But if you go over to Arizona or Colorado, you could pick up some. And uh, I'll just leave you with that, uh, those thoughts, and. Uh, I hope that uh, this will give you some glimpse of this fascinating field of ancient fermented beverages. Thank you.